On July 11, 2021, historian Gary Morgan led a tour showcasing research on the Raiders of Andersonville. The Raiders were six men who had been hanged exactly 157 years ago for crimes against their fellow prisoners. Each tour stop was recorded and is preceded by audio description for the visually impaired. Closed captioning is available. At this stop, author Gary Morgan stands on a grassy field with a crowd of people holding a microphone and walkie-talkie. On this cloudy day, the wind bumps the walkie-talkie against the microphone. The crowd stands next to a short white post with a chunk removed from the bottom. All right, hello. So the place where we are now standing is the site of the gallows. Uh, 157 years ago today, six men were hanged right here. This post marks it. There's no sign, but if you look at it, it's been hit by a lawnmower a few times. You go with what you got. We're going to try an experiment because most of the accounts of the most famous accounts of the Raiders are written by a guy named John McElroy. John McElroy I don't entirely trust. Some of his stuff has a kernel of truth in it, but a lot of it is exaggerated to the point about and out lies. One of the things that he said was that during the hanging, one of the Raiders took off. He, dis he realized he was about to be executed, and he ran that way. Um, McElroy said that Henry Wirtz saw this, panicked, ran down from headquarters, yelling at the guards to fire, and the guards refused to fire because the head of the artillery knew that the it wasn't a mass panic, it was just one guy taken off. So I have a volunteer up there on the star fort. See where those stairs are? Top of that is where Henry Wirtz's fort was. He's going to yell fire as loud as he can. See if you can hear him from this distance. Okay, you ready? Ready. Take it away. Fire, fire, Whoops. fire. Hang on, let me turn the walkie-talkie off. Or you turn your walkie-talkie off and yell it. The camera turns to show Star Fort in the distance, a series of earthworks with a volunteer barely visible. Anybody hear After anything? he yells, the camera turns back to Gary Morgan. We heard nothing. Did you yell? Fire, fire, fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turn your walkie-talkie off. Yell fire three times, then turn your walkie-talkie on and said, I yelled. Oh, can't hear him. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we could barely hear him. With the wind blowing in this direction. But also remember, there was a 15-foot stockade wall that went all around here. There were 26,000 guys in the prison that day. Yes, thank you. There were 26,000 guys in the prison that day. When this guy took off yelling, they all started, took off running, they all started yelling. And I don't think there is any possible way that John McElroy could have picked out that one, hint, that one German accented voice from that far. There's just no way. And that got me to question everything else that he wrote. Um, for example, there's, when Henry Wirtz comes in and he hands the prisoners over for execution, he gives a little speech. Everybody who gives an account of that speech before John McElroy says he said something to the effect of, here are the prisoners. I give them over to you as good as I got them. Do with them what you will. God have mercy on your souls and theirs. And then he turns and rides out. John McElroy inserts a sentence in there that said, where Henry Wirtz says, I have had nothing to do with it. That's not true. There are two general orders that Wirtz was instrumental in having implemented. One of them authorized the, the trial. The other authorized the hanging. The Confederate guards came in and they helped arrest the raiders. The Confederates act absolutely had a lot to do with it. It would not have happened without the cooperation of Henry Wirtz and the prison guards. So that said, um, what happened right here is around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, um, 157 years ago today, July 11th, um, the Raiders had been arrested, they'd been tried, and they'd, six of them had been condemned. The, they came in in a procession, the six, gar six condemned men surrounded by guards, followed by a Catholic priest, Father Peter Whelan, uh, with Henry Wirtz riding his gray horse along behind them. He hands them over to the prisoners, he makes his speech, he turns and rides out. Most of the, the diaries that were, that were left behind say that it, the, the prisoners didn't really seem to believe they were going to be hanged until they got right here, and here was a gallows. There were 26,000 guys. You can see this is a really easy place to see for most of the prison. And I believe this was the most witness execution in history. 26,000 people watching six guys being hanged. 
they had the, the six guys mount the gallows. At the last minute, one of them, they call him Curtis, uh, realizes this is it, bolts and takes off, he runs. Kind of hard to see, but there's a little creek where that really heavy dark green line of vegetation is. He makes it across the creek before they get him. When you're trying to run and there's 26,000 guys watching you, you really can't get away. They dragged him back, kicking and screaming, got him up on the gallows. Um, the priest tried to intercede and say, please don't do this. They shouted down the Father Whalen and they put meal sacks over their heads, ropes, had them all stand on one plank. The plank was pulled out at once and all six dropped. Unfortunately, the hanging was botched. The guy on one end, Willie, Kirk, Willie Collins, six foot tall, big guy. And the raiders are probably a little heavier than the, the, regular, um, the regular prisoners because they've been stealing and they've had a little more to eat. Six foot tall, drops, the rope breaks. The, the, gar the prisoners rush over to see if he's dead, and not much to their dismay, he is not dead yet. They revive him, and they get him kicking and uh, whining and crying and begging and saying it's not lawful to hang him a second time. They bring him back up on the gallows, and they hang him a second time. This time it's fatal. Um, they let the bodies hang for about 20 minutes so that everybody can see it. And then they cut them down and take them out through the south gate, which is right over there, to the dead house. Uh, the official cause of death is asphyxi asphyxiation. Um, they were hung. They died because they couldn't breathe. So we're going to do this in a little bit of a different order. Now we're going to go to the site where the trial was, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Gary Morgan stands in the doorway of the reconstructed north gate. The gate is made of two wooden walls, each about 15 feet high, with a large wooden door in the center. A crowd is gathered inside, and the cloudy sky is visible overhead. There were several different techniques the raiders used. Some of them, they would just go in at night, grab stuff, and run. Sometimes they would pretend to buy something. They would ask to see whatever the, they would go around saying they had a watch to sell. And if the guy asked to see the watch, that marked them as a potential victim because that meant he had enough money to buy a watch and he was a per good person to rob. Um, the movie Andersonville, you see large numbers of raiders r going in at night and attacking. That really wasn't how they operated. There weren't that many of them. Uh, most of the diaries say that we were between 180 and 120. And remember, there, the day they were arrested, there were 24,000 guys in the camp. So they were really outnumbered. S there was resistance to the raiders beforehand. Um, if they captured you, they would, uh, depends who caught you. Um, sometimes they would shave half of your head and half of your beard so that other prisoners would know that you were a guy to be avoided. Uh, sometimes they would ride them on a rail around camp so that everybody would see who they were. And a couple times they just threw them in the really disgusting creek. Um, this went on, this had actually started at Belle Isle. Um, three of the raiders had been at Belle Isle before, and there is a diarist there who actually uses the term raiders for a bunch of guys that he was carrying bread back to his buddies. The raiders came up, snatched the bread out of his hand, and ran and he calls them raiders. So the, the raiders term existed before this. The term raiders comes from the, te the technique of, um, I want to say Morgan's raiders, uh, Mosby's raiders, that's it. Um, it would be a short concentrated assault and then they'd get out quick. That's kind of how the raiders in Andersonville worked. They'd pick out their victim, they'd go in, they'd rob, they'd get out quick. And they all lived in, in the southwest corner of the camp. So if they got back to that southwest corner, they had guys there that would kind of watch their back for them. Um, this went on for a while, and new prisoners would generally warn, watch out for the raiders. Sometimes as a new prisoner came, they would befriend them and say, oh, come here, I'll, I'll, get, I'll show you where to stay, or I'll get you something to eat. They'll get, they'd take them into the tent and then rob them in the tent where nobody could see them. Um, you were more likely to survive if you had friends to watch your back. There was a group of prisoners from Plymouth, North Carolina, who were captured and came in. And one of their terms of surrender was that they were going to keep all of their belongings. Um, and it, it was honored. They came in here with, I've heard estimates of close to a million dollars worth of supplies and cash. At that point, that's in May, the crime rate starts skyrocketing. The Plymouth Pilgrims kind of have each other's back. If you were in trouble, all you had to do was yell, Plymouth! And the other guys would come running to help you. But if you didn't have anybody to watch you, you were in big trouble. And there was a prisoner named Dowd. Um, Dowd is an older gentleman. He's 43 years old. He is, arrest he is captured, and he is in here. 
and he falls for one of those scams. The raiders are looking for a victim. They offer to sell him a watch. He asks to see the watch. He doesn't buy it, but Sarsfield was the one that had offered it. Goes off and comes back with Delaney, Muir, and Sullivan. And they rob him, and they beat the crap out of him. Uh, John Dowd had been a farmer in Avoca, New York. He lived alone with his widowed mother. He got drafted at 43. His mother went to the draft board, said, please don't take my son. He's my only means of support. The army said, well, he's a soldier now, and took him. Um, he had been trying to save his money to send to his mother at the first opportunity. He had it sewed into the waistband of his pants. Um, the raiders came, and they tried to get the money from him, and he fought back, and they beat the tar out of him. They beat him with brass knuckles. They had knives. They sliced his hands. Um, they beat him half to death. He made it as far as the gate. Henry Wirtz saw him and said, I want the guys that did this. And he threatened, and didn't threaten. He said he was going to withhold rations until all the guys that were responsible for this were turned over to him. At that point, there's a free for all. He sends in guards to help. People are identifying raiders left and right, and they're taking them out. They probably took out about 80. Um, Wirtz looked at all these guys and said, No, I can't hold this many. Pick out the worst of them, and I'll send the rest back in. When he, they send the rest of them back in, it's kind of a horror show. They send them in one at a time. And the prisoners know they're coming. And the prisoners are madder than hell, so they arm themselves with clubs or whatever they can grab. And as these guys are forced into the, the stockade site, the prisoners are there to beat them and try and you know, get a little bit of revenge on them, since they're not going to be tried. And supposedly, one guy is actually beaten to death running, and they call it running the gauntlet. Um, John Dowd is removed from the prison. He is given liberty to move about the area up to a mile. He is one of the last prisoners who will be freed from Andersonville. He leaves late April 1865. When he gets back to Avoca, um, he's not recognizable. He was a farmer. He's not physically able to farm anymore. He tries to set up a cooper shop to support himself and his mom. Eventually, he can't even do that. He has headaches for the rest of his life and he dies in 1864 at the age of 40, 47, 48. So there is a prisoner who read about, re read about Dowd's account and realized that he had been attacked the same day Dowd was. So he assumed that Dowd must have been him, and it was just like a name that they made up. And so you might read that John Urban was Dowd. And he, I, I really think he believed he was. Um, he'd been attacked that day, but if you read the the version of Urban's account, it doesn't line up with what they say about Dowd. Um, he never saw Henry Wirtz. He says he wasn't robbed of any money because he didn't have any. And it's kind of funny. When he was being attacked, he turned and grabbed the raider that was attacking him by the throat, and then the raider started yelling for the guard that he was, that Urban was attacking the raider. So, yeah. Um, when they, they held him out for a trial, they took them up to the star fort where Mike was just yelling fire. And they chose a jury of sergeants, because the sergeants were pretty much the highest ranking guys in the prison. And they purposely chose the ones who had been here the least amount of time, because that was how they could give them the fairest trial possible. They would be the least prejudiced. The newest of the, si the 12 jurors had been here for 11 days before the trial started. They're arrested June 29th. The trial starts June 30th. They, tr they start to try Collins, but they push him back for a couple of days. They try Sarsfield, and Sarsfield is convicted. The trial is held inside the space between the two gates, so pretty much where you're standing. Um, they have a jury of other prisoners from all different states. The, the, jur the, jur the jurors were from all different states. The witnesses were all from all different states. The two lawyers, um, the lawyer for the prosecution is a school teacher. The lawyer for the defense is an insurance salesman. So if you s s read that they had you know, skilled lawyers in here, they may have had skilled lawyers in here, but they weren't, testify they weren't working that trial. Of the 15 guys that are tried, one of them has his case continued, and I've never found out what happens to him. It seems to have dropped. Um, a handful of them are sentenced to ball and chains for a period of four months. You can't really rob anybody if you go to 20 pound leg iron. Uh, there are two of them that are sentenced to wear a ball and chain for the rest of their imprisonment, and then there are six that are sentenced to death. The
The six that are sentenced to death are the four guys that attacked Dowd, uh, Sullivan, Delaney, Sarsfield, and Muir, and Willi William Collins, and you might note Collins has a, a nickname Mosby. He gets that from Mosby from Mosby's Raiders because he's kind of like a prison crime lord. He doesn't necessarily commit pr crimes himself, but he's going to coordinate it, and if you get down back there, he's going to make sure that these guys have your back. So if you can get to him, you're okay. And the last one is Collins. And Collins is interesting for a lot of reasons, but part of it is there's something going on between him and the guys from the 16th Illinois Cavalry, and I can't quite figure out what. But of the four guys that testify against Collins, two of them from the 16th Illinois Cavalry, the third one is a tent mate of one of them from the 16th Illinois Cavalry. And there is some indication that one of the guys who's, who's su suggested as being a regulator had actually robbed Curtis first. So I'm not, cr I can't quite puzzle out the details on that one, but those are the six guys that are end up condemned. Um, they are condemned as they are tried on June, th one on June 30th, three of them on June, um, yeah, July 1st, and the last two are condemned on July 2nd. So there is then about a 10-day gap where they're, I think the Confederates are trying to figure out the legalities and what, what will be the implications if they actually go ahead and turn these prisoners back over to other prisoners to be executed. The Confederates don't want to execute them themselves because that would be probably all kinds of you know, ethical violations of the Libra Code. So they're going, the tr they were captured with the assistance of the, pris the guards and the prisoners together. They are tried by the prisoners. They are held by the Confederates and they will be executed by the other prisoners. All right, we're going to move up the hill a little bit to the Rhode Island Monument. Gary Morgan stands in front of the Rhode Island Monument with microphone in hand. The Rhode Island Monument stands around 12 feet tall and includes a plaque of names. On the plaque of names is Charles Curtis, and the top of the plaque reads, Our Honored Dead. All right, the names of the six guys hanged as recorded in history. And the diaries and the grave markers have different names on them. So, first one is Patrick Delaney. The second one is Charles Curtis. Third is William Collins. The fourth is James Sarsfield. The fifth is a guy named Sul Sullivan. And the sixth is a sailor named Andrew Muir. See any names? See any of those names on here? Curtis. See what it says up the top? Our honored dead. One of the raiders is listed as one of the honored dead on the Rhode Island Monument. How's that for weird? Uh, the Rhode Island Monument was actually constructed by politicians. When they came to dedicate it, there were only three former prisoners of war present. Two of those fought for Massachusetts reg regiments. So nobody that was working on the monument actually knew Curtis. They saw his name on the list as being from Rhode Island. I think that's how he ended up here. Um, the other prisoner whose name pops up in some place really unexpected. Anybody been to Gettysburg? <laughs> the, the Gettysburg interns all raise their hands. Good. <laughs> uh, do you know that big Pennsylvania monument where they have plaques with the names of everybody from every regiment? William Mosby Collins is on the, the back of that regiment listed as a private with the 83rd, uh, sorry, 88th Pennsylvania. And the veterans at Gettysburg were so vehement that you couldn't have your name on that monument unless you fought that they would go there and actually chisel your name off if you weren't there that day for those three days. And the fact that they, the, the name under Collins is actually chiseled off, Collins' name is still there. So he was, he fought at Gettysburg, he earned a promotion at Gettysburg and his name is on one of the Gettysburg monuments. But we're gonna come back to this because this is really kind of surprising. Um, and we'll talk about it when we get over to the cemetery. That's where we're heading next and we're gonna go to the Raiders' graves. The camera takes some time to adjust as Gary Morgan stands with microphone just behind the six graves of the Raiders. From left to right, the names on the headstones read Patrick Delaney, PA, Charles Curtis, RI, William Collins, PA, John Sarsfield, NY, W. Rickson, USN, A. Munn, C., U.S. Navy. Dozens of graves are visible in the background, including recent interments just a few yards behind the Raiders. All right. So who were these six guys? That's how I got into this. Um, I got the, the letters from a Civil War prisoner, and then I found his diary. And in his diary, the only blank he left was the names of the Raiders. Six men were hanged today. 
They were tried by a jury of our own men. Their names were, and he left a blank. And I was curious, so I went and wanted to look up the names. Turned out there were seven names, but only six guys. And I was off. So first guy, Pat Delaney. He is from the 83rd Pennsylvania. He was drafted. You may hear that these guys were all bounty jumpers. They were not bounty jumpers. The only one that was a bounty jumper was Sullivan, whose name is not on any of the stones. Delaney is drafted. He does not collect a bounty. He does not want to be a soldier. Um, he's been with his regiment for about a month. There were crimes committed on the ship on the way to join the regiment. His, in his regimental history, his captain wrote that there were guys that were robbing, stealing, stabbing um, the fellow shipmates on the ship down. Uh, he said that the, the officers in charge had to practically tie their arms behind their back and hang them from the yard arm to get them to give back the money. There's another prisoner from Sarsfield's regiment who wrote that they got $18 from him, but he was lucky that he didn't get knifed because they were knifing prisoners, knifing people who were on their way to the regiment to rob them. So most of these guys have been committing crimes long before they ever got here. Um, Delaney is with his regiment for about a month. Uh, he and about a dozen other guys decide to desert. Um, they get picked up by the enemy and his captain. I have never heard anybody so happy to have his men captured as this guy was to have this group of 12 guys leave. So, um, let's see, Curtis? We'll get back to him in a minute. Mosby. He's the guy that was um, kind of the prison crime lord. He's the one that the rope breaks on. He's actually on paper not a bad soldier. He enlists in the army in May 1861. He serves two years and seven months. Officially, he is a deserter. I am not convinced that he was. Why would you serve for two years and seven months and then with just five months to go desert? The night he, le he disappears is a moonless night. His, re his company is marching on the double quick near the Rappahannock. They know there are rebels in the area. They're trying to get position around them. I think he probably stopped maybe to relieve himself. And before he could get back with his regiment, I think the Confederates got him. I don't know that for sure. On paper, he is a deserter. But he was definitely not a bounty jumper because he served two years and seven months. He is the only one who ever got promoted of these six guys. Um, the ba he was um, at the Battle of Gettysburg, which we mentioned up at the, the uh, Rhode Island Monument. He was big, he was loud, and I think that he was the man for the job at the time. It was a field promotion. Um, his company, when they were going after Iverson's brigade, were the first ones over the wall. And I think he was just big enough and loud enough that if he was the corporal, he could shout the orders and he would be seen and heard. Um, he was not a particularly good soldier. There is a letter from a hosp military hospital in Baltimore. Um, he was an interesting guy because he had been shot at the Battle of Bull Run, he'd been shot in the thigh, he'd been captured at Bull Run, he was exchanged. So he was actually a POW twice. Um, first time he was lucky and he was exchanged, the second time it was after they stopped exchanging prisoners in 1863. <laughs> so he was stuck this time. Um, he goes to the hospital for the thigh wound and he stays there quite a while. Um, he goes back with his regiment, but after a couple weeks they sent him back to the hospital. And there is a letter in his file that's actually kind of funny. It's from a prison doctor who's saying, uh, Dear Sir, Corporal William Collins was supposed to go back today to join his regiment, but he managed to escape, and we weren't able to send him. He pretends to limp whenever he thinks he's being watched, but if he doesn't know there's anybody there, he walks as well as anybody can. Uh, we found him today in town, where we have frequently found him, drinking. He has been in the guardhouse before. Please send somebody to get them, get, come and get him and return him to his regiment where he will be more use than he is here where he is a source of annoyance. So uh, I, of the four, of, of the six of them, I always kind of think he might have been the most fun to go out drinking with. But, <laughs> but he ends up here and coordinates crimes and ends up getting hanged twice. So that's a pretty nasty way to end. Uh, Sarsfield. Sarsfield's kind of interesting because he has two names. Um, this says John, his compiled military service record says his first name is James. He's a halfway decent soldier. He is captured at the Battle of Wilderness. At no point do they ever assert that he deserted or that he was a bounty jumper. 
he is drafted. He probably had only been in the U.S. for a couple of months. He was not an American citizen, but he was drafted. Um, and he's captured the Battle of Wilderness. At no point do they ever consider him a deserter. He's always listed as missing in action, detached as a prisoner. So uh, he, I think, is probably, from what I can tell, the most vicious of the six that were hanged. Um, when they went to attack Dowd, he got on top of Dowd with a knife and basically said, give me your money or I'm going to cut your, cut your heart out and shove it down your throat. Mm. Pretty brutal guy. Um, mm. And there are a couple of different accounts that have him saying that. So even though he was probably a decent enough soldier, he was probably a miserable human being. Um, let me skip Rick's and go to Munn. Uh, four of the names on these grave markers are wrong. Um, this one's probably the easiest to explain. It says A. Munn, M-U-N-N. -N. If you look at the register of deaths, it's written in cursive. His name is actually A. Muir, M-U-I-R. It's just a misreading of the cursive. Uh, he was a sailor on the water witch. He was 23 years old. Um, John Ransom describes him as saying he was a poor Irish lad on the, ga on the gallows. He was 23. He'd been a sailor for at least three years because he was, had the rank of a seaman. Uh, he's probably th two things that are really startling. One is how fast he, he went from <coughs> newly arrived to condemned murderer. Um, he was on the water witch. The water witch was attacked on June 2nd, boarded by Confederates. Uh, he ends up here June 7th. The raiders are arrested on June 29th. So he's got about three weeks and whew, what a fall. The sad thing about it is his tour of enlistment was actually up. Uh, the Navy was having a hard time getting guys to replace the ones were up. And the water which most of the guys' tours were up. They let a few go so they were shorthanded. Uh, the Confederates then board the ship and some of the guys whose tours were up actually hid rather than fight. Um, some of them just refused to fight. They said, I'm out of here. I'm not in the Army anymore, which I'm sure they regretted once they got to Andersonville. Um, he, he was just waiting to go home. They caught him, ended up with the wrong crowd, and they hanged him. He's kind of interesting, too, because in his physical description, he's the only one that doesn't have it, probably the only one that doesn't have a beard. Uh, there was somebody that wrote in their diary that it was sad to see a beardless slat up there with all those hardened criminals, which implies that the rest of them had beards. If you look at his military service record, his mission, he doesn't have eyelashes. And there's a med medical condition called alopecia in which your body's immune system attacks the hair follicles so you can't grow hair on certain parts of your body. I strongly suspect since he didn't have eyelashes and he couldn't grow a beard, because when they were taken out of the prison, they didn't take razors with them. They didn't take anything but the clothes on their back. He couldn't have shaved. I suspect he probably had alopecia. Hmm. Huh. All right. A. Rickson. There is no such person who ever served in the Union Navy named, named sorry, W. Rickson. Um, it's been a mystery for a long time who actually was this guy. And I think I know. Um, the, remember I said there were seven names, but only six guys were hanged? The seventh name is a guy named Sullivan, John Sullivan. Uh, John Sullivan was the one who was a bounty jumper and a deserter. He had been with his company a couple weeks. He took off, uh, ended up at Andersonville. A few months later, other guys in his company were captured, and they ended up down here, and they recognized him. And he went up to them, and he said, listen, if you don't tell anybody who I am, I'll take care of you as far as the Raiders are concerned. I'll make sure they don't bother you. And he wanted to do that, and he wanted to hide his identity because of the fact that he was both a bounty jumper and a deserter. Uh, before he'd been captured, there was a guy in his company who had been a bounty jumper. He joined the army, he collected the bounty, he took off after his, uh, at his first opportunity, and then he went to join the army again and collect a second bounty, and they sent him back to the same company. They recognized him, they court-martialed him. They were in the process of trying him when Sullivan was, cap was captured, went missing. And eventually they did hang the other guy. So he wants to, Sullivan wants to hide his identity. He gives people different names while he's here. He tells them his name is Terry, his name is Terrence, his name is Carrie, his name is John, his name is Sullivan. Uh, I think John Sullivan itself is probably a pseudonym because it's kind of like John Smith, only Irish. But he's, um, W. Rickson is probably, the guy buried here is probably the guy who was known as John Sullivan, um, 76th New York. Which brings us back to my friend Curtis, the guy whose name is on the monument up there. Okay. William Curtis. 
Uh, you saw his name was up there. When I was researching this, I found in a book the transcript of the Raiders trial. And I'd always been told it didn't exist or it was lost, but there it was in this book and it checked out. The name of every juror and his regiment matched an actual prisoner and his regiment. The name of every uh, who was accused in their crimes. Uh, the day that they were convicted lines up with somebody's diary. One guy is convicted the first day, Sarsfield. Um, Eugene Forbes, the first day, says one man was convicted today. The next day, three more are convicted. Um, Curtis is listed in the trial transcript, which was published in a New York newspaper, um, as Charles Curtis, alias William Ritson, W-R-I-X-O-N, of the steamship Powhatan. Does Ritson sound familiar to any of you? Mm -hmm. Sounds like Rickson. And now I was all excited because there's a, I got into this reading the Sailor's Diary. Sailor was over there in the 8,000s, and he had been captured with a sailor from the Powhatan named William Ritson, R-I-T-S-O-N. I believe that William Ritson was using the alias Charles Curtis, and there really was a Charles Curtis. And I don't know how he got his name, but I think that he was using the alias Charles Curtis to hide his identity while he was at Andersonville. Because if you were going to commit crimes on other prisoners, you didn't want them to know who you were when it came time to leave the prison. Um, the real Charles Curtis, according to his military file, probably contracted malaria. He was in the hospital from like April to August of 1864. He is eventually does get listed as a deserter on January 1st, 1865. So on paper, he deserted five months after he died. <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> um, there is a newspaper article by a prisoner whose name was William Brogger. And it, Ritson was a group, part of a group of prisoners who were captured at the Second Battle of Fort Sumter, which none of you have ever heard of. It lasted 20 minutes. It was a miserable failure. They did not take back Fort Sumter, but um, the prisoners ended up at Libby. There was an incident where there was a Confederate guerrilla burning ships off on the Rappahannock. The, con the Union Army caught him. They said, he's a pirate. We're going to hang him. The Confederate government said, you can't hang him. He's, he's military. They said, watch us. They said, OK, if you hang Beale and his 16 other guys, we're going to hang 17 of your sailors. One of the guys, they take the 17 sailors, they move them to Salisbury Prison. One of the guys that they move is my friend Fred James, who's over here. Um, I know that they move 17 guys. I can identify eight of them. They all end up at the top, of, uh, the top floor of a mill building at Salisbury Prison, which at the time was a political prison. And according to this newspaper article written after the fact by a guy named Paul Grogger, there was a guy named Curtis on the third floor of the mill building at Salisbury Prison. And he says when Curtis took a runner, he recognized him as the same guy who had been at, at Salisbury. Um, I don't, I understand why he'd want to hide his identity. I don't understand, and I, this is the one piece I can't fit together, how he came up with the name of Charles Curtis, who was an actual person. But I do believe this is probably William Ritson. If you look in William Ritson's file, which is kind of a mess, um, what it says in 18, the 1880s, they were trying to figure out what happened to everybody. In his, it says, final disposition not reported. They don't know whatever actually happened to William Ritson. I believe he became Charles Curtis, and he's right here. Huh. OK, there is one more place we're going to go, and it's down this row here. At this stop, the camera adjusts as Gary Morgan continues a conversation that began in between tour stops regarding whether or not there was evidence of men murdered by raiders. In the foreground is a row of graves, including three unknown U.S. soldiers. Two of these headstones are so close together that they are touching. The rest in the foreground are four inches apart. The modern graves, which fill the background, are all a few feet apart. And what I found, actually I started reading diaries first. And what I found was the day after the raiders were arrested, the prisoners wanted their stuff back. So they went into a tent, the raiders' tents, and they took what they could find. And when some of them couldn't find their stuff, they said, well, maybe they buried it. So they started digging under the tents. Under one of the tents, and I have a feeling it was probably Sarsfield, but I don't know for sure, 
Instead of their stuff, they found two decomposing bodies. I now went back to the death register and I looked and sure enough, July 1st, there are two unknowns. There's a grave number, 721 and 722. There's no cause of death, there's no name, there's no regiment, there's no nothing, just a number on the line. So that's these two guys. I'm pretty sure that these are the two guys that were found buried under the tent. Hmm. Um, and if you notice, the graves here are all like four inches apart or so. Until you get to these two, they are flush up against each other. I think when they finally discovered the bodies, they weren't able to tell one body from the other, so they just put them in one spot, two stones, and there they are. So yeah, some of these guys at least were definitely murderers. You don't end up buried under somebody's tent unless they put you there. So rest in peace. Uh, the other unknown on that page was this guy here, 2719. And my best guess is, remember I said that they had sent the guys in to run the gauntlet who were pulled out but not tried, and one guy was beaten to death? I think this is him. Uh, he is buried on the same day that they find the two bodies buried under the tent. And that makes sense because the guys that were, um, the guys that died on the evening that the raiders were arrested would have been buried the next day. And that would have been the day that they dug up the two under the tent. So those are three, three graves that nobody really knew about, but they, they have definite connections to the Raiders. So it's kind of hot, and I can see everybody do it, doing the, the wave. Yeah. Uh, let's head back to the museum lobby. If you have any questions, I'll answer them there. Okay. We hope you've enjoyed this special presentation recorded at Andersonville National Historic Site. Special thanks to Gary Morgan for speaking with the public and showcasing research done through the Friends of Andersonville program.